Okay. So today I'm going to be chatting about the prevalence of communication difficulties. I'm going to be talking about um, common causes of speech and language difficulties in children and also um, what typical communication development looks like. We're going to cover some more common communication impairments um, and just give you an overview of who speech and language therapists might work with, when to refer to them and what information to share with families as well as to answer any questions that you have. So for those of you who are just joining, I'm really keen for it to be an interactive session. I'm not sure if my um, uh, functionality to hear you is working very well. Um, and so please feel free to use the chat function if uh, you want to ask me any questions and I'll reply to those either as we go or at the end, um, just so that we don't disrupt the session too much. So some of you will be really familiar with this already. Um, there are many possible causes of speech and language difficulties, but speech and language development is quite a complicated thing. Um, so whilst there are very common causes of speech and language difficulties, there are some children that we work with who kind of come under this um, bracket of they have other uh, no identifiable cause of their speech and language difficulty. So I'm just gonna go through some of the things that might link in with a speech and language difficulty, but just bear in mind that there will be other children that we work with where we can't really find a reason why they've got a speech and language difficulty, they just do. So some children that we see with speech and language difficulties have more general or global learning disabilities and their speech and language skills might be in line with some of their other developmental skills. We have some children who have a specific learning disability in language, so that's called Developmental Language Disorder or DLD, which I'll talk again about later. Some children might have speech and language difficulties related to a physical disability. So an example of that might be something like cerebral palsy, uh, where the actual um, muscular difficulties might impact on a young person's ability to formulate speech. Some children's communication difficulties might be linked in with sensory difficulties. So for example, if they've got hearing impairment, that will affect the way that they're able to interact with others. Equally for children who have a visual impairment, it can be quite difficult for them in the early stages of communication development to learn new words, because the way that we learn about new words is by looking at them and hearing adults saying the words for them at the same time as we're looking at them. So they're not able to see things in their environment that can impact on their vocabulary development. There's links with um, emotional deprivation. So we know that some children who have been subject to neglect might have speech and language difficulties because they've not been appropriately stimulated. Or there might just be, um, we know that it's really important for early language development um, to have really good quality early interactions with key caregivers in the first couple of years of life. So not only if children haven't had stimulation, but if that stimulation hasn't been quite right, that might impact on a child's later language learning. Uh, at the bottom of the list there, you'll see frequent illness. So we do know that some children who have long term illness and are in and out of hospital have lots of other appointments. And um, sometimes their health just takes a priority, which can impact on their language learning as well. So these are some general risk factors for speech and language difficulties. Some of them I've just touched on already in the previous slide, um, but I'll just go through the ones that I haven't really mentioned yet. At the top of this diagram here, we have gender as a possible risk factor. And that's because we know that boys are more likely to have speech and language difficulties compared to girls. We also have on this uh, diagram here, behavioral problems. And behavior and language development are really closely linked. For some children, it might be that their behavior is an indicator of a more global difficulty that they've got going on. But for many children, the behavior difficulties will stem from a result of not being able to communicate appropriately. So it might be frustration because they can't understand what other people are saying to them, or it might be a frustration because they are not able to make themselves understood. So we're really thinking it here as a risk factor as being because um, it's a risk showing that their language 
difficulty is really impacting on their lives and probably on the lives of other people around them as well. I mentioned before that those early uh, adult child interactions are really, really important for early language development. Um, so that's the reason why attachment and postnatal depression is listed on here as a risk factor. We know that it's really key for brain development and language development for um, parents and infants to be having really positive interactions both non-verbal interactions, things like cuddling, looking at each other, and also the words that are said. So if there's any difficulties in establishing those early relationships, any problems with developing attachment between a parent and an infant, that might impact on their later speech and language development. It's not to say that every child of a mother with postnatal depression is going to have a speech and language difficulty, but it is a risk factor. It increases their risk of having difficulties. Is there any questions about anything so far? If you've got any questions, please just type them into the chat box as they come up. I'm going to continue going for now. So now we're going to talk a bit about prevalence and impact of speech and language difficulties. So. We know that upwards of 50% of children are starting nursery with poor language skills. So what we know is, is in some deprived areas, there's so many children who don't have adequate speech and language skills they need to be able to access the curriculum. Language is the way that we learn everything. We learn how to interact with other people. We learn how to cope with social situations, but we also learn the curriculum through people talking. So if children are starting school with speech and language difficulties, it's really going to have a huge impact on their overall learning and development. I've just seen a, a question coming in here from Noella about how early we can pick up speech and language difficulties. It's a really, really good question. Um, I'm going to come back to it later if it's OK, when we just talk about typical communication development. Um, so I'm going to park your question for now and we're going to cover it in a little bit and I'll point out when I'm covering it. This is a, a fact that often shocks people. In 2009, there was a study done in the criminal justice system um, which identified that actually 60% of young people, so young offenders, were actually had speech and language difficulties. And often uh, those were unidentified speech and language difficulties that hadn't been worked on. So what we're seeing is that, as I mentioned before, having speech and language difficulties going to affect you academically. There's huge links with um, your ability to achieve at school, your literacy development, but there's also links with your risk of bullying, um, difficulties getting into employment, difficulties being able to live independently and difficulties with your mental health. And so lots of the, the outlook for lots of these young people, particularly those who am, are not receiving any support for their speech and language difficulties, is, is pretty bleak. Um, there's recently been a rise, a 58% rise as the number of children with speech, language and communication as their primary need. So this is on the up. Speech and language difficulties are increasing, increasing across the board and in socially deprived areas. So this includes most of London. There will be more than 17 children in each class with language skills below the average for their age. So it's really, really shocking. And untreated speech and language difficulties are one of the most common reasons for school failure. So I guess the point of this slide is, if you're worried about a young person's speech and language development, don't just wait and see. Refer on if you think that they need the help, and we're going to talk about when to refer and how to refer later on. Which leads us on to just saying that there are speech and language therapists. We are a profession and we do help these young people. And we work in a variety of settings in a variety of ways. So these are just some of the places that you might come across speech and language therapists. Um, you, if any of you are working in the acute setting at the moment, you will know that there are speech and language therapists in hospitals. Often they are working on um, eating and drinking difficulties because we are the experts in um, 
all of the apparatus that we use for talking. We're also experts in the apparatus used for eating and drinking. So you might have come across some of your colleagues in the hospitals. Um, in some services as well, there will be um, speech and language therapists in hospitals who are working directly on communication as well. In the community, speech and language therapists tend to work in a combination of community sites like health centres and in universal model. So that means that we don't just work with children who are referred to us because we've got worries about their uh, speech and language development. We are trying to support the whole population, particularly the whole pediatrics populations, speech and language development. So the specialist service would be to assess children who are referred in to determine whether or not they have any speech and language needs and to offer therapy to them. And that therapy might sometimes might be the universal model, so it's um, on offer to the whole population. So in our service, um, so Evelina Community Speech and Language Therapy covers the boroughs of Southwark and Lambeth. So in our service, just as an example, our universal offer involves things like developing health promotion campaigns. So we have a campaign called Talk and Play Every Day, which is really aimed at um, the family. talk and play every day which is of children under the two and what we're doing is providing information about what typical language um hi sorry to disturb you i think there's a problem with the sound there's a there's a problem with your sound Development looks like what to do if you're concerned, but also what to do if you're not particularly
things and but things that you, you can be doing at home together that will help support and foster your child's speech and language We also run um, sessions for families to attend. And so typically we would run sessions in children's centres, but at the moment we are doing a largely virtual. So we have developed an online session on Facebook that families can attend.
one called Chatter Time Live. And the idea is that parents will watch with their children to get ideas. Hello. Hi, it's Charlotte. Hi, Charlotte. I'm so sorry about this. Um, um, I've lost all my internet connection now because I'm trying to tell everything through my phone. I'm Virgin Media Sound across right. um, across London, which I think is affecting things. Yeah. Um, how are you getting on at your? So I've downloaded the app onto my phone. Um, okay. I just it's now just asking me for a meeting ID or name. Okay. Um, if you um. So I go to meeting.com. Um, if, if you go to your web browser and try and open it through the web browser through that link. Right, okay. So go back to the email and now I've downloaded it. Yeah. It should do what it did. Before. Yeah, it should just open it automatically. <laughs> um, I know you've got another meeting at one, so. Um, no, actually, my other meetings are two. You moved okay. earlier, so I can stay on for a bit, but obviously I don't know if the participants who are here can. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't know how long ago you stopped being able to hear me. So we can hear you for the first couple of seconds, and then it's in and out. But because my internet's at home, I actually I'm not sure how different it is to everyone else. Yeah. Um, I think the media's out like, all through London, um, so everyone's having more Wi-Fi issues than normal. I think. This conference will now be recorded. Sorry, I have to speak. Um, I it's asking me for my intro, but it seems like one. Okay. Hi. Hear me? Great. Okay, I'm going to try and do my screen again. Has everybody else got a terrible echo? So I have got my um, microphone muted. I wonder if it's worth other people trying to mute their microphones just to see if we can get rid of some of the feedback.
Anyone hear me? Anyone hear me? Hear me? Okay, I'm going to try and do a bit more. I can hear the echo as well. Has everyone else um, muted their microphones? Yeah, my, my computer is muted. Just wondering if you can hear me if I just talk on my phone. Just wondering if you can hear me if I just talk on my phone. Just, 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 just. I'll turn the microphone off on the computer and the speakers. Great. My goodness, thank you for bearing with me. I'm going to try talking again, but I'm not quite sure at which point you stopped hearing from me. Did you guys hear this slide? Thanks, Elliot. <laughs> so you didn't hear this slide. So I'm going to start from here. Apologies if you've missed anything else. So I'm going to just go over again the way in which speech and language therapists work. So we work in this specialist, targeted and universal way. So on a universal level, we're trying to give information and advice to the whole population about early language development what you can expect, what you can be doing to help facilitate early language development and also provide um, training to the general public, so be that professionals who might come across children so that they know kind of when to... Just got feedback again. I'm going to try and move away from my computer. <laughs> um, when to refer on to speech and language therapy. At a targeted level, I'm so sorry. I don't know why my um I've started getting feedback all of a sudden. Bear with me. So at a targeted level, we would be providing similar support to families, but to families who we've maybe identified have children who are at risk of early uh, of speech and language difficulties. So, for example, we might um, run some sort of group or intervention with families where we haven't identified that the children have speech and language difficulties yet, but they might be at risk of speech and language difficulties. So, for example, we might work with families where there's been difficulties in that early attachment, um, just to provide parents with ideas of how they can best support their child's early language development. Before I say too much more, I just want to just check that people can still hear me. So if you can just write in the chat whether or not you can hear me, that would be really helpful. Great, fantastic. At a specialist level, 
we are seeing children who have been referred to speech and language therapy for assessment to try and determine what their speech and language needs are, but also we'll be seeing them for therapy if we decide that they do have needs and that therapy might be one on one or it might be group. And the setting in which we see those um, children would be dependent on what that child's individual needs were. So this is the list of um, the kind of children that we might be working with as speech and language therapists. So uh, as I said before, I don't know what you guys have heard already, but we I work for Evelina London Community Speech and Language Therapy Team. So we cover the boroughs of Lambeth and Southwark, and I'm going to be telling you a bit about what we offer, but it will be very similar in different parts of London as well. So we work with children and young people between the ages of zero and 19 and they might have difficulties in one or more aspect of their communication development so they might have difficulties with their speech or their pronunciation of words they might have difficulties talking so they might have difficulties selecting the right words and putting those words together to formulate sentences they might have difficulties with their understanding of what other people say to them they might have difficulties with their attention and listening skills. They might have difficulties interacting with other people. So they might have what we call social communication difficulties. They may stammer. Uh, uh, they might uh, have selective mutism or they might have voice difficulties. I did mention before that some of you might work with colleagues who also work with swallowing, eating and drinking difficulties. So even though it's not technically communication, because we're the experts in all of the apparatus that's used, our colleagues in speech and language therapy would work with swallowing, eating and drinking difficulties as well. So in terms of language difficulties, initially what we might see in young children is that they are slow to develop their early um, milestones. So referring back to, um, I think it was Noella's question earlier on, um, you asked at what point you might refer to speech and language um, therapy. And to be honest, it's, it's never too early if you're very confident that they've got a speech and language difficulty. The earlier, the better. We know we all know the importance of early intervention and that the first two years of brain development is really critical. So if we can be referring children at a young age, then that would be the best thing to do. But what we tend to see is that we're only really noticing that children aren't meeting their milestones at the point where they're perhaps not babbling as much as other children and children tend to start babbling between sort of six and nine months more obvious than that is that we would generally expect children to start saying their first words between 12 and 18 months so we generally would expect um that people might be picking up on the fact that there's a difficulty if they're not saying their first words between 12 and 18 months we usually see that children will be combining words by the time they're two um, so again, if a child's failing to meet that milestone, then that's when we would be thinking that people will start be referring to us. Language difficulties affect different people in different ways, as with all difficulties, and it will depend on what they've got going on. Um, and also their pattern of impairment might uh, alter with age. It can also affect their memory as well. So it can really affect them across the board. Sorry, I'm getting feedback again. <laughs> and also what we do know is that some people with speech and language difficulties can become very frustrated and quite isolated. And we saw in one of my previous slides um, the long term impacts of not dealing with speech and language difficulties. So this here is the communication tree, just for a brief overview, overview of what we would expect to be typical language development. So just like the roots of a tree, the roots of us, this tree here have to be in place before anything else can develop and grow. So these are the skills that are really developing in young children from birth. On the left hand side, we have attention and listening skills. So children need to be able to look and listen and attend to adults when they're talking to them. 
And if they've got any difficulties in this area, it's going to be very difficult for them to start to understand what words mean and use words themselves. They also learn through their play. And initially, play is very exploratory. So children will touch things. They'll put things in their mouths. They'll look at things close to their face. And I mentioned already before that if children aren't able to explore the world around them, they're going to find it very difficult to learn the words associated with the things that they're exploring. Another root of the tree is social motivation. And that is what it says it is. Children have to be motivated to take part in interactions with other people to be able to learn and develop their language skills. If all of those things are developing well and in place, those skills will continue to develop like the roots of a tree, but then children will also go on to develop their understanding. Initially, children understand familiar routines and are able to anticipate what's gonna happen. So they'll be able to anticipate when they hear that the bath water's running and their grown up is holding up a towel, that it means that bath time is gonna come. Similarly, they might start to work out that if the buggy's being put close to the front door, it means that they're about to go out of the house. Later on, what comes is that children will start to develop an understanding of, of real words. And it can be quite tricky for grown-ups to be able to tell whether a child has understood a word that's been said or whether they've just picked up on those non-verbal or routine clues. But understanding has to be in place before we can expect children to be able to talk and join words themselves. So if we're working with young children, we will always assess their understanding first and we would need to work on that before we work on their talking. And then the talking is much further up the tree. It's like the leaves of the tree. So initially what happens is children will start to babble then they'll start to use recognizable single words and then they start to put two words together, three words together, and then they'll start to make lots of different grammatical markers. So those things all need to happen before the leaves on the tree grow, which is the clear speech sounds, the pronunciation of sounds, and also the um, whether or not a child is speaking fluently without a stammer. So often the things that we see, like the leaves on the tree, whether or not a child is speaking clearly, pronouncing words, that would be what many of our referrals come to us with. People will be worried that a child's not pronouncing words. But when we're assessing a child, we'll be checking all areas of this tree. And if actually we think that they've got any difficulties with the roots of the tree or the understanding part or whether or not the child's putting words together to make sentences, we would need to work on that first because we would expect developmentally all of those things to put, be put into place before clear speech sounds. Does that all make sense? You all still with me? Anyone still here? Yay. I think there's some people still here. Great. OK, so if a child has language difficulties, so we're not talking about speech sound difficulties at the moment, we're talking about language difficulties. These are the, some of the things that you might notice. You might notice that they are not always able to respond to their name. You might notice that they have difficulty following instructions and answering questions. They might not be able to express what they're thinking or their feelings, or they might not be able to properly respond fully to questions. They might also have difficulties understanding social rules um, and behavior difficulties as a result of the frustration of not being able to understand what other people say or not being able to make themselves understood. Children with developmental language disorder, so that's DLD, they have specific difficulties in language um, form, content and use. And these are the children who don't have any other diagnosis. So they've just got specific difficulties with their language learning. I'm aware of time 
um, and that we've missed a lot of the session due to technical issues. So I'm going to hold off showing this YouTube um, clip for now, um, but perhaps if we have time at the end, I can show it. Otherwise, you can refer back to it maybe at a later date because the session's being recorded. This clip just shows an eight-year-old with uh, DLD just so that you can get a sense of how her language is presenting. It's an interesting clip to watch because she is talking. However, um, she's not really able to make much sense of the questions that she's being asked and she's not properly able to formulate her responses. And it's also interesting to see that she has real difficulties um, asking for clarification or telling someone that she hasn't understood what's been said to her. We also work with children with speech sound difficulties. So this is the pronunciation of words. This table just indicates that it is really common for children to make errors with particular sounds when they're learning to talk. And it's through practicing talking that they become clearer. So we really do expect young children to not be able to pronounce things clearly, and that's absolutely fine. This table just gives you an overview of the different sounds and roughly when they develop. So you can use that just to refer back to. Just to say that the sounds um, R and L, so the sounds made by the letters R and L, they don't usually become apparent until children are seven or eight years old. So it takes a long time for children to develop their speech or pronunciation skills. Children with speech difficulties might be unintelligible. So that means that other, other people might not understand what they say. And that might be when they're talking in single words or in sentences. So for some children, we might understand what they're saying when they just use single words. But if they are talking in a sentence or connected speech, they become much more difficult to understand. We might find that children are substituting one sound for another sound. So, for example, a really common one is that children will replace the k sound with a t sound. So rather than saying cat, they might say tat, or rather than saying car, they might sound ta, or they might omit sounds altogether. So an example of that with the same examples would be ah for car and at for cat. So some children just miss out sounds altogether. They might have slurred sounding speech, or they might be able to un unable to copy sounds that you say to them. And they might get quite frustrated at not being able to uh, produce or copy the sounds. So you can refer to a speech and language therapist for speech sounds if the parents are really concerned, if you've got no other concerns about the rest of their, their language development, but you are only concerned about their pronunciation, do refer because if their parents are really concerned, we need to take it seriously. There's lots of evidence, as there is for most things, that parental intuition is a good indicator that there is a need. Also, if there's a family history of any speech sound difficulties, that might be an indicator that a child might need some therapy to support to um, help them resolve those speech sound difficulties rather than them just resolving naturally themselves. Another useful rule to think about is as young children are developing their speech, what we often find in the early years is that parents have to act as interpreters. So for children under two, the parents might have to say, oh, he's saying this, she's saying that. When children turn three, even though they might be mispronouncing certain sounds, if they can't make themselves understood, that's a cause for concern because generally children will make mistakes, but people will be able to understand what they're saying. So if they're about three and no one's understanding them, that's a good time to refer them. OK, next thing we're going to talk about is stammering. So this is also known as stuttering and disfluency. They're all interchangeable terms that mean the same thing. And I'm going to give you some examples of what stuttering or stammering might sound like. So it might present as repetition. So someone might uh, repeat the first sound in a word. So this might sound like but, 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 balloon. 
they might repeat the first syllable in a word. So that would sound like bull, 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 balloon. They might repeat the first word in a sentence. So they might say, uh, I, 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 I want, or they might repeat a whole phrase. I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it, I want it. You might also see somebody who stammers doing prolongation. So this basically sounds like you're stretching out a word. So it would sound like this, aeroplane or no. Blocking is when the sound physically gets stuck before it comes out of the mouth. Sometimes you might not notice it, but sometimes blocking can be very visually apparent. So it would sound like this. Ball or go. So the sound actually gets stopped before it comes out of the mouth. So they're what you might see on the surface in terms of the stammer, but usually there's lots of feelings and behaviors associated with stammering. So we use this iceberg analogy to um, represent that the overt stammering, what we can see is just a tiny part of what somebody might be experiencing with their stammer. Often there's lots of feelings re related to the stammer and these feelings become more apparent as a child gets older and becomes more aware of how they feel and also how other people might react to their stammer. So there might be some negative feelings associated with the stammer. There might uh, be actual behavior changes. So a child might avoid doing certain things or avoid particular people uh, because of their stammer. So any therapy support that we'd be offering to a family would cover all of those areas. So just to say that it's really not abnormal for children to experience a period of non-fluency. So a lot of children will go through a burst of language development when they're about three to three and a half. And when they're going through this burst of language development, they will stat stammer or stutter using those things that I uh, modeled before. So they might do repetitions, they might do some prolongations, but usually it just resolves itself in a period of sort of four to six months. So, don't, you don't need to refer straight away, but if a child has been stammering for more than a few months, so about four to six months, um, you might want to refer on for some therapy support because it's just likely at that point that it's not going to resolve itself and that they might actually need therapy support to help resolve the stammer. If the parent or child are particularly anxious, you could refer before that stage because if we know that parents or children are highly anxious, that's an increased risk factor that that child's going to need therapy support to help. Um, and if there's a family history of stammering, again, it's more likely that child's going to need therapy to support to resolve the stammer. Another area that we work with is ASD, or Autistic Spectrum Disorders. I know that there's another session later on today, I think, about autism. So that will go into autism in much more difficulties here. But here we just have um, represented the dyad of impairment experienced by people with autism. So they have impairments in social communication and interaction and restrictive and repetitive patterns of behavior. And you can see that that area, A, impairment in social communication and interaction, is pretty much our jobs as speech and language therapists. So. We have two roles with regards to autism spectrum disorders. One is that we are involved in the multidisciplinary diagnostic service of autism. Um, so we would help to diagnose these difficulties, but also we would offer ongoing support to families where children have a diagnosis of autism so that we can help to support their social communication and interaction. So some of the things we might do if we're working with young people with a diagnosis or if they don't get a diagnosis, we might refer to these children as having social communication difficulties. We might um, help develop their pre-linguistic skills such as shared attention, um, eye contact. We might help them or help the adults who are, who are working with them or the parents to actually help those children to become a bit more motivated to communicate. Because often young children with autism spectrum disorder might be quite independent and they're happy to do things for themselves and don't necessarily want or need to take part in two way interactions. So we might help um, those around them to develop situations in which the children have to practice their speech and language skills a bit more. 
We might be involved in implementing alternative communication systems. So some of you might be familiar with PECS, which stands for Picture Exchange Communication System. For some young people with autism, they might use pictures to communicate rather than words if they're not using words, and we would be helping to implement that sort of system. We also do a lot of parent training and we work with parents and teachers to help adapt the child's environment to promote communication with the end goal that we're actually going to develop their language skills. And we also might just do some work to help communication be as socially appropriate as possible. So an example of this might be uh, one time I was working with a young person in a nursery class and he kept on um, hitting out at his peers. And then we worked out that the function of that hitting out was actually because he wanted to be able to play with his peers, but he didn't know how to initiate that. So the therapy work that we did with him was literally to support him to learn a phrase, hi, can I play, and what to do if he was told he could play, and what to do if he was told he couldn't play. So helping him to become more socially appropriate in that context where he just wanted to be able to join in and play with some of the other children, but he didn't quite know how to initiate that. Please keep the questions coming if you have any. It's very strange presenting on a, in the virtual world because you don't really know what people are thinking. So please let me know if you do have any questions as we go. We've just got two more examples of the sorts of children that we might work with. Um, this uh, second to last one is uh, children with voice difficulties. So these children might have difficulties with their voice being quite hoarse or breathy or they might have an excessively high or low pitch voice, or they might sound nasal. Um, the reason it says there you'll know when you hear it is because people often worry themselves that they might miss this, but if a child's got voice difficulties, it's, it's quite obvious to tell that something's not quite right with their voice. Their voice difficulty might be transient, and it might be linked to laryngitis or an episode of cold, and so of course those children do not need to be referred to speech and language therapy if it's just temporary. But for those where the voice difficulty seems to be persisting, and perhaps um, the thing that brought on the uh, voice difficulty in the first place, like the laryngitis has resolved a long time ago, then we might want to be thinking about referring on to speech and language therapy. Because what we want to do is make sure that children or young people are using their voice in an appropriate way that in, so that they are not gonna end up having long-term damage to their vocal folds by using their voice in, an, uh, in a, a difficult way. So if you are going to refer to a speech and language therapist for voice, we'd recommend that you also refer to ENT so that they can check things structurally. Um, some general advice that you could give to families uh, to drink some more water, um, just to keep those vocal folds nice and hydrated. We would recommend voice rest in a way, but really what we're meaning when we say voice rest is that children should avoid shouting too much. They don't need to not talk at all. They just need to try not to shout or use a quieter voice. We don't recommend whispering because that can put strain on a voice as well. So just talking at a normal level. Um, it's useful to try and just make sure they don't have any reflux type things going on. So managing food allergies, avoiding spicy food and eating uh, avoid eating close to bedtime can all, all help manage voice difficulties as well. And then the last kind of difficulty I'm going to talk about is selective mutism. So this is one of the only speech and language difficulties that's actually more common in girls than boys. And it really is a phobia of speaking. So it is usually, typically these people will have um, age appropriate speech and language skills and they will be okay to talk in certain situations, but there will be certain situations that they do not feel happy to talk in. So a really common example is that they will talk at home, but not at school. And it's often picked up and identified at the point where a child goes to primary school, even though the difficulties might have been there before, it's the first time that it becomes really apparent that it's a difficulty that's not just shyness or reluctance to speak, um, that it's actually something that is causing a child a real phobia of speaking in um, certain situations. So again, we have a role as speech therapists to support those young people. So on the following few slides, I'm going to just leave you to perhaps read this in your own time. Um, uh, just need to check with Katie that you guys are going to have access to 
the slideshow. I guess if it's being recorded, you will. Um, Katie, if you can perhaps write in the comments. I'm just aware that we are really running over time because of the technical issues. And the next few slides really just go through. Um, so it's going to be on YouTube. So the next few slides just go through at different ages reasons why you might want to refer on to a speech and language therapist. So for a two year old, if they've got fleeting attention or they're not responding to their name or they can't follow simple instructions, they're not using many words or only using single words. And if no one at all can understand what they're saying, they're not making eye contact and they're not seeking interaction. They're the kids that you might want to be making a referral to speech therapy for. The way in which you would do that will depend on the borough in which you're working. If you are working in the boroughs of Southwark and Lambeth, um, you can refer to our team, Evelina Community Speech and Language Therapy team. And I'm going to uh, put a link to our website on the last slide. So you just go to the web page and you can fill in the referral form. We also have an open referral system so the parents can self-refer. Um, and if the child is a school, um, you would probably uh, refer the parents to chat to the school about how they can get speech and language therapy support in school. So as an example, again, in Southwark and Lambeth, some schools commission from our service and some schools buy in their own independent therapists. At three, you can just read the slide there. These are the things that we would expect a three-year-old to be doing. So if you've got worries that they're not doing any of these things, then you might want to refer on. And then we've got the same thing for four and five-year-olds as well. I think the key thing to point out there is we would expect a level of um, developmental disfluency or stammering with children under five. So if they start stammering when they're five years old or above, you probably don't need to wait the four to six months and you could just refer straight away. Are there any questions about any of that? Okay. So I'm so sorry for the, the technical issues, but I just hope that the session's given you an overview of typical language development, what you would expect children to be doing, the fact that there are speech and language therapists and we have a role in supporting children where things aren't following that typical pattern of development um, and certain groups that we might work with as well and the way in which we might help work with them. We have got a website which I mentioned before and the website's really useful to click on for leaflets. I mentioned our health promotion campaigns earlier. Um, so we have health promotion campaigns called Talk and Play every day, which um, highlight for parents what they can be expecting of their young child's language development and how they can help. And those leaflets are available to download for, for everyone. So it doesn't matter where you're working, they're, they're accessible for everyone. There's useful links to other websites as well. And on our Facebook page, where there's a link to there, we're running lots of live sessions at the moment. Um, which have been particularly developed um, off the back of COVID and not being able to do some of our sessions in children's centres that we would usually do. So there's a session called Chatter Time Live, which is de um, designed to support parents who have children under five. So parents can tune in and get advice about how to support their child's language development. And also there's an interactive circle time with stories and activities and ideas of things that they can be doing to support early language development. So it's it's aimed at a universal level. Those things will help everyone. But particularly if there are parents who are feeling like they, they want to be doing something and they're a bit worried, I would send them along to Chatter Time Live, which they can access again, regardless of where they live. Um, and particularly if you're making a referral, you might want to send them to chat to access Chatter Time in the interim. Um, and there's a similar session aimed at school aged children called School Talk Live. Um, again, just to get ideas of how you can be supporting your school aged um, child at home. And the school aged children are very much encouraged to interact with those sessions as well to get some ideas of how they can support themselves at home. These are some other useful websites. Um, and for any of you who uh, might be working independently, there's a link to uh, Help With Talking, which lists all the private speech and language therapists as well. And now is the time for any questions. And um, there's a link to a 
survey monkey feedback i know that you're all going to have some feedback about the technology and i'm ever so sorry the technological issues today um i would have much preferred to be able to just talk and interact with you with ease so hopefully it hasn't affected your ability to um interact with the session too much but please if you have any questions about children and their speech and language development or what speech and language therapists do please type them into the chat box now and i will do my best to answer those oh Katie's just thanking everyone for your patience with the technology and I really echo that. I'm so pleased that there's still still 18 people out there taking part in the session. What's the lower age limit that we might see? We really don't have strict referral criteria in our service. Just turn my echo off, that's good. Um, this might vary on where you're working um, in different boroughs, they might have different criteria, um, but we would be looking for there being enough evidence to say that this child probably has a speech and language difficulty. If we thought that they perhaps just had risk factors, what we might do in the interim is perhaps signpost them to some of our universal services, so we might be making sure that we see the parents for like a one-off session to give them some advice about what they can be doing to support their child's speech and language difficulties. We might be inviting them to take part in that chatter time session. Um, and then if they try that for a couple of months and they've still got concerns, then we would be accepting that referral in. So it's not that there's a kind of lower cutoff point. We just might be wanting to make sure that they've tried other things before they need to be referred into the specialist service. Joanna says, do you see children who have language delay but are being taught another language other than English at home? And how do you go about it? Thanks, Joanna. It's a really, really good question. Um, we see many children who don't have English as their first language. We um, in Lambeth and Southwark are really diverse populations. And there's, I think I saw latest, there's um, nearly 250 languages being spoken in those boroughs. So what we would be looking for in terms of early language development for a bilingual child is that they are meeting those early language milestones. So as I mentioned before, that they will be using their first words between 12 and 18 months, that they will be combining words between um, around two years. Um, and we want them to be doing that in whatever their best language is. So we don't mind if that first word comes in whatever language, as long as there is a first word, that's great. If they're combining words in a different language, great, as long as that combination of words is happening. And what we do sometimes see if a child is growing up in a household where there's more than one language, when they get onto that combining stage, they might be combining one word from one language and one word from another. And again, at that stage, we don't worry about that as long as they're meeting those milestones of combining words. Um, so that's the first thing that we're looking out for. If we then do think that they need a referral to speech and language therapy, we would work with interpreters. So we would work with an interpreter to assess them, to gather case history information from their family, um, also just to assess them. And then we would be delivering um, intervention via an interpreter as well. There is a really great leaflet on our website, which is keep your language alive, because one of the common misconceptions about bilingualism is that we would recommend that families only speak in English, and that is not correct. We really want parents to provide a good role model for their child, and we want parents to enjoy interacting with their child. And all of the evidence shows that that's most likely to happen if they're speaking the language that they're most confident in. So, Sorry, just muting my speakers again. Um, check out that. Um, check out the website for that leaflet. But yeah, we do work with families with more than one language. Um, it's and and it doesn't increase their risk of having a speech and language delay by being exposed to more than one language. Um, but we would just want to make sure that we're delivering therapy to them in an appropriate way. Do you think that cultural differences may affect the way that some children present? Of course, we know that there are differences in the way that different cultures interact um, and there might be cultural sensitivities. So some cultures, for example, I know that it's disrespectful to um, look an adult in the eye. So we would consider things like that when we are 
making a judgment about whether or not a child is making appropriate eye contact. So we do try to take those differences into consideration. Um, and certainly where play isn't such a, a kind of a universally acknowledged thing within some cultures, we do find that that sometimes has an impact on a young child's speech and language development. There are always going to be children who are robust enough to um, just pick up the language that they need through the environment, but it might be that if their speech and language isn't developing according to what we would expect, that we might need to try and work with those families to find something that the, the families feel okay with, um, but we think that it will also benefit the child. So I guess that's just a lot of open discussion with families about what those parents feel comfortable doing and adapting in the name of benefiting their child's early language development. Are there any resources on YouTube demonstrating an SLT session? The best thing I would say, um, Noella, is if you tune into our Facebook page and look at these Chatter Time live sessions or the School Talk live sessions, you'll get a really good sense of what a speech and language therapy session looks like. I think that's really useful for parents as well if they're wondering what might happen. You can look to see what that might look like. We've also got a, a clip on our website for a YouTube video that we've made about what parents could expect from speech and language therapy. So that might be a nice resource to look at and to direct families to as well. Oh, thank you, Al. A great session despite early difficulties. I really, really appreciate you all staying with me. Does anyone else have any questions? share the websites on the chat yeah um i'll copy them from my slide over to the chat anything else what's the best advice to a family who talk language at home and teach them a different language So just to check I've understood the question right, Hisham, is the, is the question that the family are talking in language, but they're also trying to teach another language to their child. I think if it's that, I would just say make sure that you're just having fun and talking in the language that you're feeling most confident in, that you're giving your child your best role model in. And then if as a family you've decided that you're going to learn Spanish together, that's absolutely fine as long as you've not got worries about your child's language development and you're just doing it in a fun way where you're all learning together. Um, I think just take the pressure off. Young children learn the best through play. So if you want to do a bit of exploring in another language whilst you're playing together, great, fine. But just make sure that when you're having your interactions, that's not affecting how much you're all getting out of the interaction together. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think I've got the right end of the stick. So fine to learn another language. Do it as a fun, a fun thing that you're doing together as a family. Great. OK, so I'm going to try and copy some of those websites into the chat. Um, while I'm doing that, please do type in if you've got any other questions. I'm just going to pop my camera over to the side so that I can just uh, type. Great, so I'm going to turn my echo off.
I think the session's finished. Thank you all for sticking around and running over with me. Um, and hopefully if I come again, we will sort the technology out a bit better. So I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and we'll speak to you later. Check out our website and our Facebook page.